Fade In, Carnegie Screenwriters Look at the Film Industry in Pittsburgh. Often we talk about writing and screenwriting, but today we're going to talk about sound. My guest today is sound engineer Chris Bell. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We're excited to have you here. We do usually focus on screenwriting because we're a bunch of screenwriters, but really sound is obviously such an integral part of our craft. And I think people really don't know sound don't think about sound unless it's bad sound. Am I right? That is 100% true. Tell us what goes into it and, and why your job is so critical. I think it's a lot of attention to detail, mm -hmm. not too different from uh, capturing footage on, on film or anything like that, but it needs to be consistent. Okay. So if people are talking and you're hearing the edits and hearing airplanes dropping in and mm -hmm. out and you know, static and thunderstorms and all the things that you know that absolutely should not be there, it's going to completely take you out of the illusion that what you're watching is, is real and supposed to be there. Yeah. And so how do you do that? Start us back at square one. When you start on a, a film set or television, I know you've done a lot of different, different mm -hmm. things, and what, what happens when you come on set? What's the first thing you do? Well, the first thing I do is I make sure to meet with the AD and find out how many speaking actors we have. I don't always get um, scripts and things like that. Okay. And once we figure out this, you know, the schedule and things like that, we'll get uh, mics on the talent. And once we get rolling, um, basically it's just getting the mics close is, is the name of the game. That's going to make it a lot easier to hide the edits in post-production. Mm -hmm. Uh, getting as much coverage as humanly possible, just like with camera, you know, wide shot, close up, insert, all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's the same thing with sound. Uh, try to get the best sound as humanly possible with all the takes that you can. Mm -hmm. And if something isn't perfect, make sure you have enough coverage with what you have. Getting wild lines if you don't have enough mics to cover actors that have maybe one line or things like that. Tell us what wild lines are. Wild lines are maybe an actor who is off camera or uh, maybe you just didn't like the way something sounded where you actually have them speak their line off camera, mm -hmm. uh, just wild. Uh, hey, what's going on there? You know, when someone passes through a doorway or you know, turns their back and walks away, things mm -hmm. like that, uh, you grab a line. Of so you have them record it separately. Mm -hmm. And then when you do something like that, what do you do with it? How, tell us how that works in the edit. In post, we'll, we'll sync it up. Uh, basically, you'll go through and find the original line that was recorded on set and just lay it underneath it and just cut out the other one, just to make sure it's laid basically in the same spot mm -hmm. uh, to maintain some sort of uh, continuity so it doesn't feel like it's they've set it too early or too late. Right. Uh, recording stuff like that is better to do it on set because you're recording with the same mic in the same room. Makes it sense. doesn't sound like ADR. Yeah, yeah. And ADR stands for? Automatic Dialogue Replacement. Mm -hmm. And when you do something like that, is it, do you have an actor come in and look at the film and have them record exactly to the way their mouth moved the first time? Or is it, do you hope to get mm. a shot from behind? Or what's the process like? Well, it, it depends on what the line is. It could be uh, them out of frame. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, I'll just have them run it four or five times and send them on their way. Yeah. But if they are, you know, up close, not a wide shot, and you can clearly you see can their tell. lips moving, uh, they need yeah. to get I like to go three passes at least of them getting it where it's spot on. Okay. And it, at the very least, I'd like to be able to comp those three together to try to make a usable take out of it. So do you, you cut and splice and mm -hmm. put things together? Yeah, very much mm -hmm. so, just like in, in the editing room mm -hmm. to, to help tell the story. And if uh, the mics have a, a similar or the same perspective, it's a lot easier to do that. Okay. You know, if you're going from the mic 10 feet away to the mic one foot away, obviously that's not going to work. So you use different mics, obviously, labs mm -hmm. like we have on yeah. right now, and then you have a boom. Can yeah. you talk about um, the difference in the sound and the quality of those? Well, uh, the first misconception is there's no such thing as a boom mic. Oh, <laughs> the interesting. The boom is the pole. Okay, the boom is the pole. <laughs> I learned something. But I, I call it that. So. Uh, and he's chastising <laughs> me, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so the boom is the pole. Yeah. Uh, and so when someone yeah. says something about the boom. Yeah, typically those they, sound a lot more natural. Okay. Uh, Lavalier mics tend to sound a little more um, voice of God, you know, huh. like right Because up they're in so your face. close. Right. But you can change the perspective and post a lot easier than trying to fix something that doesn't sound very good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but basically, the labs are great for, for wide shots. Okay. I like to just kind of leave them on the principles all day yeah. and run the boom if, if I'm able to get in there. So you if do it, both. You mm -hmm. do labs and boom at the same time. Yes. Okay. And you have different tracks, obviously, on yeah. your equipment mm -hmm. that records it, too. Yeah. Here's what I've always wondered about the boom. It looks so heavy. It is How not. Is it? It's not. Yeah, it weighs like four pounds. 
But you're holding it for an hour. How do you keep it out of the I've shot? never held it for an hour. At right, one, at okay. one, yeah. It, I mean, typically a take is going to average a, a few minutes. I mean, the longest okay. I've ever held it up in the air was about 10 minutes. So how do you keep it out of the shot then? <laughs> <laughs> Little, little uh, sound humor, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We've been dying to do that, sorry. Uh, well, the first thing is to kind of establish frame. If I can get a look okay. at the frame line, say, mm -hmm. on the viewer, on the back of the camera, or if video village is nearby, yeah. then I'll just kind of take a look. Or if you can't, just ask the, um, the camera operator, hey, what's my frame line? And they'll just okay. say, dip in, and you, you know, before we go, you just kind of dip into frame, and then they'll tell you when it's there. Okay. And, and just, you know, I always try to stay, if they say, my, you know, my eye line is at the top of the fridge, I'll just maybe stay a couple inches above it just to be safe as you get tired. Sure. You, um, yeah. you, you yeah. kind of sink <laughs> a little bit. Sag a little, sure, yeah. yeah. But that's pretty much it. I just really ask for a frame line. And, you know, as the night goes on and you get tired, yeah. I hear, hey, boom's in the shot. Yeah. You know, get it out, get it out, up, 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 you mm -hmm. know. So. And then do you rest? You set it down in between and you rest mm -hmm. so that you're ready Yeah, to... between takes, if I know that I'm going to have a couple minutes, yeah. I'll collapse it and then just stick it on the front of my bag and just kind of rest and, just and, and relax a little bit, yeah. Do you have to do a lot of upper body work? No joke, to no. be able to hold that. No, really? No. I mean, I, don't, I just, really don't exercise. I'm okay. really lazy. <laughs> Getting a little personal, <laughs> sorry. Uh, huh, yeah. well, I've always figured that you really needed, but I guess if it weighs four pounds, you don't really. It's very light. I mean, it's exhausting to hold, to hold for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. but if it's, uh, say, a standing interview, yeah. we don't have a boom for this, but if we did, it would be on a C-stand. Okay, We've sure. We've been talking for over five minutes, and yeah. if someone was holding it, they'd be getting tired by now. Yeah, and would you still do a boom and, and loves if for you were doing a sitting interview? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done it a lot. Okay. I've not. I've done just boom or just labs. It just depends. Yeah. Depends on the client. If they ask for it, I do it. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And is it is there one that you prefer, or is it really you have to use both to get the sound you want? Um, I like to have both. I prefer labs because of the they're a lot easier to make them sound like the environment that I want them to be in. Okay. Uh, the boom or shotgun mic or whatever is on the boom sounds a lot more natural, though. But it takes in everything around you. So if you uh, hear the air yeah. conditioning or... Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, the labs are a little more isolating, especially mm -hmm. when you're for exteriors. Mm -hmm. It's it's If it's windy, if it's sure. there's a lot of traffic, if there's somebody talking behind camera, um, flipping script pages, a lot of that will, wow. will pick up on an overhead it's mic. It's very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, it, we sort of broached it a little bit, but we've talked a little bit about your work on set, but also you do sound design and sound editing yes. behind the scenes mm -hmm. as well. Tell us what that is like. Do you take your own sound, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. or do you or work Or someone else's. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like to do post on stuff that I've worked on on set, obviously, because I know what to expect. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'll, you know, I'll take anything if, they, if they're you know, sending it my way. I've yeah. worked on stuff that I didn't do location sound for. But basically to start, you know, I get my video and I set up my session. Mm -hmm. And the first thing is always the dialogue edit. Okay. Go through line by line, scene by scene, cutting, swapping out alternate takes or something that sounds bad if I can't fix uh -huh. it. Noise reduction, EQ compression, things like that. What is EQ? Uh, EQ is just kind of like on your stereo, all the little sliders. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, low, mids, and highs, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, the human voice doesn't really reproduce anything too, too low. Mm -hmm. So you can always cut lows. That makes room for the low frequency sounds like that you would find in music. Okay. Uh, making room for other sounds is, is, is more of what you're going to do. Uh, the human voice really is a pretty mid to high spectrum. So the EQ is, is a really good friend in post. You can really just cut notches and make, make room for, you know, big bass heavy sound effects like sure. gunshots, explosions, yeah. slamming doors, punches, things okay. like that. And you've done a lot of that as well, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. What is that called when you put in sounds that maybe weren't recorded well or weren't there to begin uh, with? That's called Foley. Basically, okay. where you would reproduce with either by recording a sound mm -hmm. that either is the object or something that sounds plausibly like the object to, okay. to give you a sense of realism and to take the film to a different level. Can uh, you tell us what kind of things you've used to, is there anything really crazy that you've used to sound like something? Um, something that you mean wasn't what it was well, intended to be? Correct, yeah. Uh, there was a scene where uh, two characters were fighting on the ground and one character was slamming his head into the hardwood floor, and I actually had my wife was recording fully for me. You did not slam your wife's head. No, into no, 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 okay, no. Okay, no. good. All right. She, uh, goodness, no we were trying so to figure we're out uh, where we could get that thump on the hardwood floor. So okay. she uh, said, "Oh, I got this sack of flour," and she wrapped it up in a towel and put a microphone in front of it, and she just kept slamming this bag of flour into the, wow. the hardwood floor. 
and it worked. And it sounded and like it, someone's head. Yeah. Yikes. The human it sounded head. like something that weighed about the size of a human head being yeah. slammed into a hardwood floor. Uh, so when you get uh, a film, you usually get something that is called picture locked, correct? It yeah. is pretty hopefully much ready, to, hopefully <laughs> ready to go, and then you do your magic. Yes. Okay. Yeah, starting with the dialogue edit, and then once that's there, I'll kind of move into what we call like ambient sounds and mm -hmm. backgrounds where we'll lay in like an environmental sound mm -hmm. to kind of seam up and hide the edits like birds, crickets, ah. uh, air conditioner hum, room tones, sure. things like that to hide all those edits to kind of set the place and then you start laying in your footsteps, uh, cloth pass which like if people were fighting. What is that called? Cloth pass. Cloth pass. Yeah, okay. so like if people were fighting you hear like oh. you know, people uh -huh. grabbing each other, things yeah. like that. Um, all, all those sorts of things, and then just prop handling. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's uh, cutting a piece of chicken, you know, on the table. What does that sound like? It sounds like a fork and a knife on a piece Tastes of china. Like chicken? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that you've done, any film that you you've done uh, fully work on that you really are proud of, or is interesting, or that you that we can just see right now? I'm proud of all of them, but I really enjoyed Always a Bridesmaid. That's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> because it was the first uh, kind of lighthearted romantic comedy that I ever worked oh. on. So it was a chance for me to do just kind of very realistic Foley mm -hmm. that wasn't um, over the top and sensational in any way. Yeah. And, and there was nothing crazy or weird or even very difficult about what I did for that film, but I was proud of it because it was, it was a milestone as far as doing something different for me. Okay. Let's watch a clip from Always a Bridesmaid. Two, three. That's me, Lizzie Gribowitz, perpetual bridesmaid. This is my sixth wedding in 13 months, fourth as a bridesmaid. So let me tell you how this goes. Charlotte made her catch at our cousin Marcy's wedding. She got engaged the next month. I broke two fingers. One, two, three. Meg caught the bouquet at our cousin Charlotte's wedding and got engaged to her on-again, off-again boyfriend six days later. I got a sprained ankle. This time, it's my turn. So you've done film, obviously, television. What other things have you done? Uh, a lot Different. of ad work and commercial work. I've done uh, worked on the Giant Eagle commercial. I uh, did something for the uh, pregame for the Stanley Cup Finals for oh. Game Two for ESPN. But that was interesting. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Was that recording or was that post work? Uh, that was recording. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it was live, so it was a little more fast paced and, and crazed than a film. Was set. that the interview or was the the actual game or what? Uh, it was pregame, okay. so it was interviews with uh, both teams mm -hmm. and just kind of a lot of b-roll and and stuff like that but it, it's all very fast-paced. Yeah. You, know, you know you're waiting to get in the locker room and there's 40, 50 other uh, media uh, people you know cameras and sound and, and uh, reporters and things like that. Yeah. And music, you mentioned earlier, have you done music videos or? Uh, like I've not or? worked on any music videos. Typically, mm -hmm. they probably really don't need my services or stuff okay. like that. Uh, Why is that? Well, because, I mean, they're going to sync all that stuff in post and they're going to play, layer okay. the song over top. It's more pantomiming. Oh. Any sound that's occurring, they'll probably put up through some kind of playback system wow. so they can pantomime too. Or anything I would get so on set would be. it's all pantomime, you're saying? Yeah. You're just crushing For the most us. part. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Darn. Yeah, they're not actually performing that they're stuff. They're not performing no. live. Ugh, no. wow. You learned something new. Yeah. yeah. What else have you worked on? Um, a lot of the independent films here in town. Okay. So films like Transients, Last mm -hmm. Rain, that we did for the 48-hour film project. We just did another one called The Three Chocolatiers. I hope I said that right. <laughs> and uh, uh, just a ton. Always a Bridesmaid, obviously. Right. Um, just a ton of short films. A film called uh, Craig Quits His Day Job, which is exactly what it sounds mm -hmm. like. Was that a feature? Was that it? was a feature length, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So that's the kind of work that's being done here, both shorts and features. Yeah, shorts and features. Mm -hmm. uh, the shorts are great because, you know, obviously it's something that you can get done over a couple days and it's a lot easier to produce, but it's great to have a proof of concept, which is, I, I imagine, the original intention of a short film. Yeah. You know, if you're trying to turn it into a feature and you can show it to a producer or a potential backer and say, hey, mm -hmm. uh, 
me and my friends put this together and you know we think it's really good and we'd love for you to look at this and yeah. that's our short proof of concept. Well, you mentioned friends. I think there is a really good community of independent mm -hmm. filmmakers here in Pittsburgh. Very is much. that how you get a lot of your work is word of mouth yeah. and, and recommendations? Yeah, I would say 75% of my work is through referral. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And the other 25%, do you advertise or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a website that's kind of under construction <laughs> and, and I'm really not good with stuff like that. Yeah. But it's uh, cold calls, emails. Wow. Okay. Things like that, yeah. uh, joining all the Facebook groups, just sure. hunting, you know, spending, you know, on a day off, it's not uncommon for me to spend three or four hours just hunting and looking for work. Yeah, running your small business, yeah. which is what it is. pretty much. And is it just you, or do you have other people who work with you? It is just me. Well, you do it all, a one-man yeah. band. I try to, yeah. yeah. I might occasionally bring people in to help out with Foley work and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, if I need an extra pair of hands, but it's typically just me. Yeah. Or if you need a nurse, say, to help you out, right? Yeah. <laughs> Medical consultant is a legitimate IMDb it, credit. It, uh, that's true. <laughs> so, well, I know you brought some of your equipment with you today, I did. right? Would you like to show us sure. what, what you do in yeah. the real world? Mm, Great. Grab it. All right. So this is your bag. This is what yes. we always see you wearing. Yes. My, my sound baby, if you will. <laughs> and how much does this weigh? This looks heavy. Uh, if it's fully loaded, probably about 15 or 20 pounds. Wow. That sounds like that yeah. could get exhausting. It can, but I have a harness over there on the floor that when I'm wearing that, it, it takes all the weight as four connect points. So it, sure. it takes the brunt of the weight. And what's in here? Okay, so I have my uh, Zoom F8 uh, mixer that, recorder. The air conditioning just came on. I love it, but I'm not right. recording sound for this, so <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's all right. Um, so. But yeah, uh, it's a Zoom F8 field recorder. It mm -hmm. does uh, eight channels of separate isolated tracks. Okay. And, and so do you record all eight channels or does it depend on the number of actors you have? Yeah, it depends. I have. Mm -hmm. um, that gets a little crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's really only worth it if they have a substantial amount of lines. Okay. If it's a little one line here and there, yeah. I mean, I'll try to catch it with Can the boom. Pick it up. Mm -hmm. And I brought a couple radio mics with me, a couple Sennheiser G3s. And Can you pull those out and yeah. show us? Absolutely. It's just a tiny little thing. It's not too different than the Sonys that we're currently wearing. Okay. So basically, uh, the microphone uh, hooks on the talent, uh, mm -hmm. either clips on for an interview and you want to hide it for films. So you would yeah. probably tape it to the inside of their shirt or clip it in a bra or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, in, in hair, under caps. Sure. All kind, you That's can, why you wear the cap all the time. You have you a can, mic hidden in there. I do all the time. I knew it. You can plant them uh, on, in door frames. Wow. Uh, on tables and bowls of fruit. Yeah. Run it up through a pen cap. That's very. For, you know, if you're like a utility man no or idea. something. No idea. Yeah. yeah. All so that, do you, what is, the, how does that attach to someone then? So basically, it has a little clip mm -hmm. where they can put it in a pocket on their belt, things like that. You can put like a waistband with Velcro around them or okay. something to the that. Leg. Which is, um, I don't know if I brought those with me, but it's just a little <gasps> nylon band that I won't yes. pull out the one that still has fake blood all over okay, it. Okay, good. But it's a nylon band with Velcro. You just wear it around your waist, and you uh -huh. can tie it around your leg or something like that. Uh huh. And then you, um, you just pop the mic in, you turn it on, and, and then the receiver goes into here and it records the audio. Great. Yeah, what it's... else is that? It looks like you got all kinds of stuff in there. Oh, um, I have some lapel mics in oh. here. Uh, I got my battery. I have some moleskin, which is the tape that I swear by, which is what you would use for warts. Oh, really? The, the fabric tape, yeah. yeah. And that's what I and stick. And that's just because it holds so well. It sticks really well to fabric. Mm -hmm. So I'll tape it to the insides of clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to stick to talent skin because people can have tape allergies. Oh, sure. And also, uh, once they start sweating, I gotta constantly reapply. Yeah. And that just is downtime on set. Yeah. And I'm having to constantly run over there and, and uh, retape a mic on somebody. Yeah, you don't wanna waste time with that. No, yeah. I do not. Well, it's pretty self-contained. It is, it's, um, you know, slots, I got room to expand a little bit and I'm all about organization and keeping everything neat. And, <laughs> That's good. And yeah. I'm very OCD about that. Well, then you know where everything is and it's easy to. Absolutely, to. yeah. I'm very routine oriented when, uh, when it comes to doing this. You also brought your boom. I Sorry, did bring my your boom. Your shotgun you... microphone attached to a boom. <laughs> I did, <laughs> did and, you, you and, and, and everybody who was watching saw yes, it earlier. Yes, I did see it come in. Do you want to show us how you would work yes. with that? Absolutely. So the um, oh, we got somebody slide in and off, <laughs> off, off stage it's just here. Just in. So the the premise behind this is um, not it hasn't changed much. Only the just the overall designs. It's just a, a, a three segment extension. I mm -hmm. believe it's aluminum. You just loosen it. You ex extend it, and then you can. Uh, if I would be standing drop up, you know, mm -hmm. I would just drop it in. There it is. And then you just kind of get in there. Uh, they always say to aim for the mouth, but that's 
tough because it's a golf ball sized target. It's yeah. a lot easier to aim for the chest. Oh, it's really? like a paper plate size target, which makes it a lot easier to just kind of tip it in, yeah. get as close as you can, yeah. ask for frame line. I see the heck out of that right see, now. Yeah, that so would I'm, not pass That would muster. not fly. I'd no, be, who would, he yeah, would be Ian Altenbaugh would be yelling at me he would like yell crazy. And yell, and you don't want to get on his bad um, side. But you know, you can always kind of go up and you can, you can see that the mic itself is out of frame. I'm still reasonably you're close. You're so that people can see how you're holding it on the other end. Yeah, and so I'm reasonably close to you. Yeah. Obviously, the way my arms are extended is actually wrong because you would get very exhausted holding them up yeah. like this. What and is you, a better way to hold it? Um, you kind of want it to be a little closer and just kind of relax. Oh. Uh, don't lock your arms. Yeah. And your knees? Um, I always kind of maybe spread the legs apart, just kind of disperse my weight a little bit. But sure. I, I don't like to lock the elbows because yeah. you get exhausted and yeah. eventually you start to shake. You start yeah. shaking. Yeah. And yeah. there's a cable that runs through here and you actually end up hearing it. Oh, wow. It does and pick up everything. That's very difficult to remove in post, if not impossible. Good to know. Yeah. yeah. So if I see a shaky sound guy. If you hear, yeah, you see a shaky <laughs> yeah, sound guy. we should take guy. a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fascinating. Yes. And you also teach young kids how to do this, is that right? Yeah, uh, not so much location sound for film. I teach them how to uh, handle microphones and do a lot of audio recording okay. uh, in Pro Tools, which oh. is the, the, the software of choice for music recording and stuff like that. But okay. uh, they're not, they don't seem to be terribly interested in film. <laughs> yeah. But we've done some video projects with them. And, uh, and who are these kids? What is the program? Uh, it's through the Pittsburgh Housing Authority. It's mm -hmm. called the Creative Arts Corner. Oh, great. And it's basically kids 6 to 18, oh, basically. Oh, that young. I'm surprised. Yeah. Um, and, and we taper it off for the, for, for the younger kids. We don't, you know, teach them anything crazy yeah. uh, or too difficult that would lose their interest. You, you only really get their attention for about 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. But basically, yeah, we teach them audio and video production. And we'll do little short videos. And uh, the Housing Authority wants to have constant content. Uh, being delivered. We, we did a short trailer. I wish I had a clip. Oh, I, wish uh, did I didn't even think about it. It was called Apocalypse Island where we basically spitballed ideas with these kids over the course of two weeks to come up with a fake movie trailer. Great. Uh, and, and they wrote it? And uh, we, well, they, uh, the, vid the video um, guy had wrote the script. Okay. But basically uh, we ended up with a seven minute short film wow. <laughs> out of this. <laughs> Made by and kids. Made yeah. By um, and they basically uh, on green screen reacted Oh, that's great. To his direction. Yeah. And we just peppered in, and it was total co copyright infringement. We cut in like scenes from Jurassic <laughs> we Park. Be and, that. <laughs> yeah, scenes from Jurassic Park and, and things like that. Wow. Um, and the basic premise was that uh, Mark Zuckerberg owned an, an island <laughs> and that he was sending all these YouTube stars to this to island. To the island. Yeah. Great. I because bet they, they were getting that. more hits on Facebook and stuff than, than he was. That's great. <laughs> so, what do they hope that the, the kids will take away from this? Well, it's an inner city program, so kids who are, are more exposed to drugs and, and mm. violence and things like that. So they're hoping they have a positive outlet for them to, at the very least, just have fun. Yeah. And something that they can do creatively and, and they can come home and show their parents, like, hey, I did this today. We made yeah. a short film or we worked on this project That's great. And, and, and things like that. So That's great. If, if anything, it's, we just hope that they're having a good time. Yeah. Uh, but there are a few shining stars that, that are really good mm -hmm. and if we're doing our job especially with the older kids they're able to just kind of run the recording sessions themselves that's fantastic and we hang back in the back of the studio and just kind of take advice take questions whenever yeah. they uh, feel there's something that you know they need to know they'll yeah. ask what's another movie that you've done that you would like to show our audience I'd like to show transients oh. and why is that a favorite uh, it's a very crazy movie uh, about uh, an assassin who basically has kind of brain damage and amnesia and he's starting to regain some memories and so the whole film there's a it's kind of fractured okay. and, and so there was a lot of very interesting sound design points uh, for me and also ca great camera work a lot of very fast cuts and uh, it also was uh, when I started working with some of the people that I work with in town on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a turning point for me in my career and in independent film. Let's see a clip from Transients. They're not going to stop. You know, I'm still getting confused all the time, and these people won't even let me see my daughter. I just, let's just get out of here. Ava, come inside. Sir. Sir. If you don't leave now, 
I'll be forced to call the police. You've also worked on documentaries. Mm -hmm. I know you and I have worked on a documentary recently. Yes. And that is Full Strength. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah, that was a super fun project to start working on. I know we got a whole lot more to we do. We have a long road ahead of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's basically following a young hockey team mm -hmm. uh, throughout the course of the season. I know we, what we did was the trailer, right. if, I'm not, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, and uh, a lot of interviews with coaches, yeah. uh, Elaine Lemieux, Mario Lemieux's brother, uh, who owns the Pittsburgh Ice Arena, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just a, such a fun project to work with all these kids, and I was honestly astounded, most of all, at how many of them are just so super gigantic. They are giants, these boys. I felt yeah. that I need a, la a ladder to put yeah. a lab on some of these kids. <laughs> <laughs> we have a cute picture we'll show <laughs> of that, <laughs> that very picture. thing. Yeah, that's right, that very thing. <laughs> but yeah, it was such a fun project, and it was so light to be on that set, yeah. you know, with you guys, and Lori Fox, and, and uh, Brandon Rudabush, and, and Adam Shaheen is always a joy. A great, really great group <laughs> of people. Yeah, yeah, and it was so light and fun. And so, Chris, you talked about teaching um, some young people what you mm -hmm. do. If there are other people who are starting their professional careers would like to do sound like you do, what would you recommend for them? Where would you tell them to go? Well, there's probably many answers to that question. Sure. But I think that, for one, you would have to have a love for what, what you do or want to do. Mm -hmm. So you would always have had, had a deep love for sound. Uh, Doing the research, I think, is one of the most important things. I constantly do research to see what other sound guys are doing. Mm -hmm. I pay very close attention to when I watch movies and television to the sound. Uh, not just the story, but also the sound. Sure. Um, you learn as much pick as up you can. We don't, I'm guessing. Y yeah, generally. Yeah. Uh, I probably overthink it a little bit too Maybe. much sometimes. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so. doing the research, learning the fundamentals, mm -hmm. and regardless of what job you do in life, whether you are True. going to be a doctor or a producer or a sound guy or whatever, uh, learn the fundamentals, learn yeah. the most important key things, the things that are never gonna change regardless of technology mm -hmm. and time and technique. Um, th those are the most important things. And, and also find a good apprenticeship program if possible. Okay. Or um, get on set as a PA. That's one of the best ways to find what career you may want to take in film because I yeah. known people who wanted to be producers and actors and then they started getting away from that and doing more camera work sure. or sound and, and things like that. And so as a production assistant could could you shadow the sound person or do you just sort of have to keep your eyes open? I would say on an independent film set possibly mm -hmm. if they could free the PA up to help as a sound utility person but mm -hmm. say on a larger budget set there would be a separate group of people that would be utility yeah. that, that, that might uh, help the sound person that would run cable, pull cable when, when they're hooked to camera, uh, sure. maybe place microphones, occasionally boom, and things like that. Great. Well thanks very much for that. That was informative and it was great talking with oh, you. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of Fade In. I'm your host Caroline Collins and I hope you'll join us again.